let me read you a quotation. This is from an article that got a lot of attention in The Atlantic a couple of years ago called The Case for Reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Quote, white supremacy is a force so fundamental to America that it is difficult to imagine the country without it. Reparations is the price we must pay to see ourselves squarely. Close quote. And Tom Sowell, who actually saw Jim Crow with his own eyes and experienced it, responds, how? It would be nice to know his uh, evidence for what he said, just to be old-fashioned about it. Uh, no, it, 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 it was a rotten system. But I don't know how, how, how we get from that to reparations. I mean, what we see in the United States in terms of the bad things, you see all around the world. If you were to give reparations to everyone whose ancestors had been slaves, I suspect that you would have to give reparations to more than half the entire population of the globe. Slavery was not confined to one set of races. I suspect that most of the people who were either slaves or slave owners around the world were neither white nor black. I mean, this was, this was a universal curse of the human species. Africa, the Middle East, Asia, oh, slavery took place and, everywhere. And, and, and it continued elsewhere long after uh, it, it was abolished in the Western countries. Right. Nowhere have intellectuals seen racial issues as issues about intertemporal abstractions more so than in discussions of slavery. Moreover, few facts of history have been so distorted by highly selective filtering as has the history of slavery. To many people today, slavery means white people holding black people in bondage. The vast millions of people around the world who were neither white nor black, but who were either slaves or enslavers for centuries, fade out of this vision of slavery as if they had never existed, even though they may well have outnumbered both blacks and whites. It has been estimated that there were more slaves in India than in the entire Western Hemisphere. China, during the era of slavery, has been described as one of the largest and most comprehensive markets for the exchange of human beings in the world. Slaves were a majority of the population in some of the cities in Southeast Asia. At some period or other in history, as John Stuart Mill pointed out, almost every people now civilized have consisted, in majority, of slaves. When Abraham Lincoln said, If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong, he was expressing an idea peculiar to Western civilization at that time, and by no means universally accepted throughout Western civilization. What seems almost incomprehensible today is that there was no serious challenge to the moral legitimacy of slavery prior to the 18th century. Christian monasteries in Europe and Buddhist monasteries in Asia both had slaves. Even Thomas More's fictional ideal society, Utopia, had slaves. Although intellectuals today may condemn slavery as a historic evil of our society, what was peculiar about Western society was not that it had slaves, like other societies around the world, but that it was the first civilization to turn against slavery and that it spent more than a century destroying slavery, not only within Western civilization itself, but also in other countries around the world, over the often bitter and sometimes armed resistance of people in other societies. Only the overwhelming military power of Western nations during the age of imperialism made this possible. Slavery did not quietly die out of its own accord. It went down fighting to the bitter end in countries around the world, and it has still not totally died out to this day in parts of the Middle East and Africa. It is the image of racial slavery, white people enslaving black people, that has been indelibly burned into the consciousness of both black and white Americans today by the intelligentsia, and not simply as a fact about the past, but as a causal factor used to explain much of the present, and an enduring moral condemnation of the enslaving race. Yet two crucial facts have been filtered out of this picture. One, the institution of slavery was not based on race, and two, whites as well as blacks were enslaved. The very word slave is derived from the name of a European people, Slavs, who were enslaved for centuries before the first African was brought in bondage to the Western Hemisphere. 
It was not only in English that the word for slave derived from the word for Slav. The same was true in various other European languages and in Arabic. For most of the history of slavery, which covers most of the history of the human race, most slaves were not racially different from those who enslaved them. Not only did Europeans enslave other Europeans, Asians enslaved other Asians, Africans enslaved other Africans, Polynesians enslaved other Polynesians, and the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere enslaved other indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Moreover, after it became both technologically and economically feasible to transport masses of slaves from one continent to another, that is, to have a whole population of slaves of a different race, Europeans as well as Africans were enslaved and transported from their native lands to bondage on another continent. Pirates alone transported a million or more Europeans as slaves to the Barbary coast of North Africa at least twice as many European slaves as there were African slaves transported to the United States and to the thirteen colonies from which it was formed. Moreover, white slaves were still being bought and sold in the Islamic world decades after blacks had been freed in the United States. What marked the modern era of slavery in the West was the fact that, as distinguished historian Daniel Borston pointed out, now, for the first time in Western history, the status of slave coincided with the difference of race. But to claim that race or racism was the basis of slavery is to cite as a cause something that happened thousands of years after its supposed effect. As for the legacy of slavery in the world of today, that is something well worth investigating, as distinguished from simply making sweeping assumptions. Too many assumptions that have been made about the effects of slavery on both blacks and whites will not stand up under scrutiny. Back during the era of slavery in the United States, such prominent writers as the French visitor and observer Alexis de Tocqueville, northern traveler in the antebellum South, Frederick Law Olmsted, and prominent southern writer Hinton Helper all pointed to striking differences between the North and the South and attributed the deficiencies of the southern region to the effects of slavery on the white population of the South. These differences between northern and southern whites were not merely perceptions or stereotypes. They were factually demonstrable in areas ranging from literacy rates to rates of unwed motherhood, as well as in attitudes toward work and violence. But attributing these differences to slavery ignored the fact that the ancestors of white Southerners differed in these same ways from the ancestors of white Northerners, when they both lived in different parts of Britain and when neither had ever seen a black slave. Does the moral enormity of slavery give it any more decisive causal weight in explaining the situation of blacks today than it did in explaining that of whites in the antebellum South? There is no a priori answer to that question, which must be examined empirically, like many other questions. The fact that so many black families today consist of women with fatherless children has been said by many to be a legacy of slavery. Yet most black children grew up in two-parent families, even under slavery itself, and for generations thereafter. As recently as 1960, two-thirds of black children were still living in two-parent families. A century ago, a slightly higher percentage of blacks were married than were whites. In some years, a slightly higher percentage of blacks were in the labor force than were whites. The reasons for changes for the worse in these and other patterns must be sought in our own times. Whatever the reasons for the disintegration of the black family, it escalated to the current disastrous level well over a century after the end of slavery though less than a generation after a large expansion of the welfare state and its accompanying non-judgmental ideology. To say that slavery will not bear the full weight of responsibility for all subsequent social problems among black Americans is not to say that it had negligible consequences among either blacks or whites, or that its consequences ended when slavery itself ended. But this is only to say that answers to questions about either slavery or race must be sought in facts, not in assumptions or visions, and certainly not in attempts to reduce questions of causation to only those which provide moral melodramas and an opportunity for the intelligentsia to be on the side of the angels.
Just as Western Europeans in post-Roman times benefited from the fact that their ancestors had been conquered by the Romans, with all the brutality and oppression that entailed, blacks in America today have a far higher standard of living than most Africans in Africa as a result of their ancestors being enslaved, with all the injustices and abuses that entailed. There is no question that both conquest and enslavement were traumatic experiences for those on whom they were inflicted nor is either morally justified by whatever benefits might come of this to subsequent generations of their offspring. But history cannot be undone, nor does conceiving of races as intertemporal abstractions have any such track record as to make it look like a promising approach to the present or the future.